Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 6 of Night Call and we are back home and now let's look. You open your front door and your foot hits something. Oh no. Hope it's not a corpse. An envelope, okay. Someone slid it under the door, Pussy. Or maybe our whistleblower friend? No, he opened it straight away. It's a police file. He laid on a table. Oh great, even more police files. It must be from your passenger, the whistleblower. Oh, okay. You smile. He kept his words. Aw, thank you. you. Take a few minutes to update your board with your new clues. You're suddenly overcome with the desire to sleep. You close your eyes, press your fingers to your eyelids and let out a yawn. I think this happens every night. You glance at your bed and get to work. Yeah, we can't sleep now. Okay, so wait. Oh, okay, so those are Julian's files. Whoa, they take up a lot of time to analyze. Okay, but... At the moment... There are a lot of things that point to him. He had wrinkles on his hands that could... Oh, okay. That could be her too. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, yeah, I mean, everything points to him. Also, what I realized, he calls himself the judge and he was divorced from a judge. So maybe there's something there. Victim 2 was a fierce politician. Okay. Killer had wrinkles on his hands. Victims killed with one bullet in the neck. Weapon police gun in the 70s. Rare gun used in the 70s. First three victim files were not part of a police leak. Oh, okay, so maybe because it could have incriminated him. I think that it is safe to say that he wasn't, that he's not our prime suspect. So I think I'm just gonna blur him out. What about him? Yeah, he could still be. He's a police man. I don't know. I mean, everything at this point points to him. He's a cop. He knows what he's doing. And I think I want to use the time to look at Julian's files. Okay, so we don't have any time for another victim report. So let's see. Okay, so this is Julian's file. His first case was this of a child molester. Pierrot's dad worked on Rictoden's scandal. Okay. I think I need to put some order into this. Okay. So I think I I put some order into all this stuff. All these mar all these clues without a real connection, I kind of stacked up here. And yeah, I think down here those are the ones that most of the uh, most of the suspects have. And then there's like here below every suspect there are like the, the individual ones um, sometimes so what i also found out is i also found which what more we have learned from julian's case um from julian's files i think it is a little bit uh complicated when you have so many clues and it never really is marked on up which ones are new so i kind of think that this is a little bit of a drag but I have found out that Julian's files state that Hervé received money from the Rick Toden's trial so he got money okay so wait a second also we also know that I heard it in our taxi that the victim number two was a fierce politician also victim number two had a stolen wallet and victim number two was Charles Beaugrand Okay, so maybe I'll just put this up here. Oh, 
Okay, then also what we heard is, or according to Julian's files, victim number three is a colonel of the junta, the process, which brings us back to her. So she escaped from Argentina when she was young and she lost her parents because probably of victim number three also. She also has the wrinkled hands, speaking for her. I don't know. I mean, the death looking like an execution, this could also lead to her in the end because her parents were maybe executed too. So what else? There was one more about... Oh no, for um, the weapon kept in perfect shape by a professional. So this leads more to the both to both of the cops. Also that the first three victim files are not part of a police leak. Okay. Well, we can't look at anything more, but I kind of want to know um, more about victim three the next time. The phone rings and you jump. You're not used to hearing it. No one ever calls you. Oh no. It must be Busset. Hmm, let's pick it up. You pick up. Busset sounds irritated. You there? Yeah, yeah. Listen, it's... She pauses. You suddenly hear a ruckus in the background. Probably noise at the station. Busset raises her voice. Anyone got the time? Hey, guys, anyone? Fuck, there are only Neanderthals here. Listen, it's early and I'm wiped out. So are you, I bet. Let's get straight to the point. What do you have for me? In a calm and methodical voice, you start giving her the evidence you collected. You start with the first suspect, their connection to the victims, the rumors, then a second suspect, and so on. A few minutes in, she lets out a whistle. Not bad at all. Seriously, you should come give a lesson to the zombies I work with. A long sigh. I have some good news for you. We checked the alibi of one of the suspects I gave you. As you listen to her, you turn to the board and pull down the suspect she's referring to. So, it's gotta be someone else. She snickers. You know how lucky you are? I'm doing your job for you, pal. Well, I'm doing your job for you, so, huh? You're doing my job if you would start driving a taxi. Okay, enough chit-chat. Gotta run. I call you in two, three days, okay? Understood. Good. Good doggy. I'll call you in three days and you'd better have what I need to make a proper arrest. The DA has fangs. We're pretty sure he's going to turn into a werewolf at some point. She babbles on for a while. Her voice becomes softer, but just as sarcastic. That would explain his terrible breath. Okay, I'm out. She hangs up. You hold the handset to your ear for a while. You have just one thing in mind. Sleeping. And forgetting it all. Wait, what? It's, it wasn't her? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Well, then I, I really think that it's the old police guy. With a heavy hand, you wipe your tired face. You pull open the sofa bed, which unfolds with an unpleasant creak. You collapse onto the mattress. The events of the day run through your head. The streets, the passengers, their faces, their problems. Your brain is running at full speed, your body aches and you're in pain. You can tell you need to get more sleep. We always do, huh? You glance at your investigation board. I mean, we didn't use up all our time, so maybe we're getting more sleep this night. Your investigation is taking shape, little by little. Who'd have thought? If only Busset would give you a little more time. You shake your head and your mind wanders for a second. Your eyes close and you can feel yourself drifting off. Until you hear a voice break out in the distance. The cat is dead. And then silence. You close your eyes without any idea where the voice is coming from. A second later you're asleep. Whose cat died? Oh no. I'm sorry. You open one eye. You find your studio calming. There's something special about living in a garret. Like yours is the last place before the sky starts. You get up quickly. And a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. Night four. Okay, here we go. Okay. 
Okay, so we've been to both of these places already. Who's he? He looks dangerous. We've seen her around a lot before too, so... Him or her? Let's go to her. Okay, so there's two more places that we could inspect. Out of nowhere, you hear a voice whispering in your ear. Oh no, it's us again. Ludwig, this is where I died. You break hard, there is no noise in the cab, no noise outside. A silhouette appears on the back seat of the cab. Its features appear one by one as if drawn with a paintbrush. Oh no, what? So much suffering. You squint. A little boy. Would you be so kind as to drive me? <laughs> Get out! <laughs> Where? M very well. Let us drive then. The boy's silhouette flutters for a moment, then disappears entirely. What the hell? You hold your breath. On the back seat behind you, the boy slowly reappears. We're turning crazy here. You start driving. The Arène de Paris, please. You jump. You see the specter behind you, seated in his usual spot. His silhouette seems warm and kind. 49 Rue Monge, I think. Come on, get going. I don't want to miss the beginning of the show. Uh, the show? Well, yes, the amphitheater show. You don't answer and are evidently surprised. There's a Roman amphitheater in Paris. Were you not aware of this? Um, a Roman amphitheater. The amphitheater is right in the middle of the Latin Quarter, hidden, mysterious, and very discreet. Like you are a scary little kid. Yet one night I heard music and I followed the scent. The scent of garum filled the streets that evening as cooks busily worked around the fire. Garum? A sauce made from fermented fish offal. You gag. <laughs> okay, that doesn't sound too. It's delicious! Oh well, if you say so. Uh, politely nod. I assure you it's delicious. The smell of garum goes right to your head, makes you salivate. In any case, once you taste it, you love it. Anyway, I was walking towards the amphitheater. The little ghost pauses, trying to remember where he left off. I entered the gate and saw all of Paris before me. For 2,000 years, the spirits of the city have gathered there to reenact the festivities of days gone by. An old poet with gaps teeth recites a few words, always the same passage. We bring fighters into the middle of the ring to reenact Roman battles. He smiles slightly. My mother would scold me for saying this, but the bear always triumphs over the Christian. You are struck by a strange smell. Garum, maybe? Sour, thick, vinegary, repulsive and compelling. Your small passenger silhouette begins to fade. You, the living, you only see things on the surface, their edges, their crests. The amphitheater is tied down to the earth like it has roots. It's not going anywhere. Ever. Its roots run beneath the city. They touch speed limit markers, houses, cobblestones, Roman baths. He stops, breathes. The salty taste in your mouth is making you thirsty. All the way to Rome. I would li have liked to go to Rome. He lifts his hand to point to something in the distance. I'll get off there. Before you can make the slightest move, the little ghost disappears in a split second. What the hell was that? You stop the cap and take a minute to collect yourself. Let me guess, he didn't pay. Oh, great. Well, how did he get there? Is that LV again? No, maybe not. Let's go to her. Hopefully she's not a ghost too. Or hopefully not another ghost child climbs into our car before we get there. Oh, there are a couple. Well then, let's go. 
The two passengers getting in your cab can't be more than 17 and are holding a board game in their hands. <laughs> oh, okay. Five miniatures and a dozen oddly shaped dice clatter on a board I stay settled in. Are they playing Dungeons and Dragons? The girl speaks to you. You're not an expert, but it looks like her clothes are brand name. Uh, we're going... She turns to her friend. Where are we going, Pierre? To Xenofax secret chamber. I mean in real life. Come on, focus. I'm focused, it's just... I never saw Rodolphe's mom like that before. She was screaming, waving her arms. It was awful. You clear her throat. The girl speaks up. Okay, uh, we'll go to my place then. It while, please. She turns to her friend as you start driving. Well, uh, we'll start playing again at home? We can't keep playing, we're missing a player. Rodolphe isn't allowed to play anymore. We're so close to finishing. You know full well Rodolphe won't be playing. His mother said he wasn't allowed to anymore and he'd never dare lie to her. He's as cowardly as an elf from Vreod. They smile in tandem. You suppose it's an inside joke. You raise your gaze and it crosses the girls in the rearview mirror. Actually, sir... You detect a hint of an accent, very faint, very distant. Have you ever been in a role-playing game? <laughs> oh wait, what the hell are you doing, Shane? Calm down. A role-playing game? Uh, yes, you play a character. You fight monsters, find hidden treasures. You definitely can't place her accent. We usually have another player, but his mom is a demon. They smile at one another. Another inside joke. It would be really cool if you could play with us. All we have left to do is take down the big bad guy in a story. Xenofax. And we'll be done. You watch them. Have no fear, I'm the game master and I'll explain everything. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> well, why not? Their faces light up with joy. Oh, <laughs> Really? Yes. But you'll have to explain the rules to me. Don't worry, you can play Rodolphe's character. It'll go quicker that way. I'll tell you a, a story and you can choose what you want to do. Anything I want? Uh, no, not anything. It's role play. You have to play a role. Be your character. Respect his alignment. His alignment? She turns to her friend. You're making this more complicated than it needs to be, Pierre. She takes on a very serious tone, highlighting her accent ever so slightly. Listen, I'm going to walk you through this. If there's a problem, you roll this die. She points to a small six-sided die. Whether or not you resolve your actions will depend on this die. You roll it each time I ask you to. I'm driving. I'll do all the rolls, don't worry. The important thing is to choose wisely, not to mention your life points. Since you're playing a thief, your character is pretty weak. If you take too many hits, you die. Other than that, I think it's best if you just go with the flow. You'll see, it's much easier than it seems. Um, okay. We have to tell you about your character. Oh, damn it, I should have asked maybe before more about them. The boy nods. We'll get started soon, don't sweat it. You are Shubak, a chaotic good thief. You're a half goblin. A half goblin. Your mother was a goblin. They're these little creatures, not really mean, more like playful and facetious. Facetious. She nods. Her sidekick chimes right in without leaving you any time to process. And your father was a human. He passed himself off as the avatar of the god of moods, a, divi a divinity who controls half the world the game takes place in. 
He and his family were all necromancers, evil wizards if you prefer. But we killed him. The battle was epic. You raise your eyebrows. I killed my own father? I know it sounds weird, but you actually freed an entire province from the tyranny of a bloodthirsty man. We became heroes because of it. Since you don't seem convinced, the boy brings new blood to the conversation. If it makes you feel any better, I killed my wife in a fit of rage brought on by an albino mummy's curse. Well, that's certainly a strange round of Dungeons and Dragons. The game master cuts him off. Let's talk about your abilities now. Your character is a thief. He knows how to be very discreet in order to make surprise attacks. He can also pick locks and mock people. Mock people? Pickpocketing, if you're... Oh, that's him. It's so hard to see because the, the, the indication always points to her. Pickpocketing, if you prefer. Ah, oh, okay. But I don't think that will help you much in this case. The girl shakes her head. You never know, Pierre. He wields a magic dagger named the Cobra's Tooth. It can poison anything and anyone. Oh, that's what him again. Oh. They glance at each other, probably remembering something. You have 29 life points left, which is not that much. And I think that will do. Pierre, anything to add? He shakes his head with an amused look on his face. Tell him quickly who you're playing so we can start. Sangrenat, a human warrior. Picture Arnie. You nod. I'm just like that. Not much grey matter up top. You're oddly not surprised when you see how puny the boy is. But don't worry. We've been friends for a long time. We've gone through so much together. He shuts his eyes slowly like he was enchanted by the idea. The girl claps her hands together abruptly. All right, let's go. Swell. You narrow your eyes in surprise. What 17-year-old says swell? You're in Xenofex's anteroom. In a nutshell, you've already attacked him and you used the powers of a magic ring to weaken him. But he escaped and he's hiding here in an old abandoned fortress. She stares at you with a look at it that... With, uh, she stares at you with a look that says you on board, you nod. You explore your surroundings, run your fingers over the heavy tapestries that cover the dark walls. Before you is Xenofex's gate, a venerable wall sculpted in the finest wood of Nertz. You know you'll never be able to get through it, you'll have to find some other way. What do you do? Silence. Pierre holds out his hand. Your turn, Chubog. Oh, him again. Your turn, Chubog. Mm, very well, then. So, uh, what do I do? Tell us what you want to do. So, like, uh, you take a deep breath. I take a look at the tapestries. That looks good. They depict battle scenes. On the ground, among that horses, are the heads of enemies impaled on spears. Xenofax is standing among the corpses. Behind him, an army of elves is poised to attack. You feel a chill run through your body. And something grabs your attention. One of the tapestries seems unusually clean. She watches you. I go in for a closer look. I move forward to see what Chewbacca is doing. I point the tapestry we're talking about. It's strange, really. Like someone touched the spot a lot. Ah, I got it. I, I lift up the tapestry. The Game Master smiles at her friend. It's too heavy for your tiny half-goblin arms. I respectfully push my thief friend aside, grab onto the tapestry, and rip it off the wall. Remind me how much strength you have again. 22. Should I roll? No, no, you're good. 
Sangrenat tears the tapestry in two with his burly arms. The cloth falls to the ground, unveiling a sort of medallion in the wall. Chubak, you immediately recognize it. It's an incredibly powerful magic lock. The kind used only by the most powerful sorcerers and leashes. Leashes? Leashes, my friend, are a glitch in the world of magic. They are magicians who have lived for too long and fallen into darkness, violence, death. He treats himself to a dramatic pause. And remember, Chewbacca, we already eradicated one many moons ago. Pierre's friend follows his lead. Something feels off, like maybe your friend Chewbacca is not quite the same person. Having Xenofax nearby is altering him, it's to be expected. Goblins are highly sensitive of black magic. Chewbacca, this medallion is a magic lock. You know this, but you don't have the key. What are we going to do, Chubak? We can't wait for the Xenofax to ter the terrible to come out. You clear your throat. Mm, play along. Indeed, dear um, Sangranad. Indeed, dear Sangranad. <laughs> but perhaps I have something on me that will allow me to break a, a, a picked lock. The game master smiles coyly. You suddenly notice the dagger on your belt is glowing just a bit. Hey, Chubak, look! I take it out. You pull the dagger out with a yelp of surprise. It's burning hot. The higher you raise it, the closer it gets to the medallion, the hotter it gets. The princess was right. She told us the snake was an ally that would open doors for us. Well then, do you dare open the door? You nod. I gather we don't have any choice if we want to open it. I use the dagger as a key. There is no hole in the medallion, but as you bring the dagger closer to the wall, the stone appears to open so very slightly. The blade slips between the bricks. You turn it slowly and the gigantic door begins to shake. I pull out my axe. The door opens, but not as you imagined. Each piece of carved wood pulls off like it were coming to life. All of a sudden, the coast is clear, and Xenofax's chamber is before you. I go in. I stick to him like his own shadow, my weapon raised and ready to fight. You slowly enter Xenofax's chamber. One long torch lights the room. The walls are bare, there is a desk covered with papers, a locked trunk, a straw mattress upon which your enemy appears to be sound asleep. After searching for so many years, the monster who killed your parents and your friends is right there with an arm's reach. Tension builds in the back of the cab. <laughs> what do you do? I examine my surroundings. You can see perfectly well in the dark. I will now determine how well he can see. You need at least a four. Why are why is the view so weird? Okay, strange. I can't change it though. The die rolls across the board. Oh, okay, because she rolls the dice now. He almost screams. Six. Critical hit. The game master immediately takes up her deepened voice again. As you move toward the bed, something catches your eye. The breathing under the blanket, it's repetitive, like a loop, like a string of notes played over and over again on a harp. I stop. Oh, what's happening? Sangrena, it's not Xenofax. <laughs> I turn around and cling to my friend Chubak. A shadow emerges from the wall in front of you. I attack girl glances over at her friend. You sure? Sure. Very well. Just as a figure appears to stand up from the shadows, Sangrena strikes him with his axe. Roll for damage. Uh, sneak attack? The girl hesitates for a second, looks at her papers and... Yeah, go ahead. Her friend rolls the dice. How much do you have in dexterity? 
They swap numbers, throwing unfamiliar words at each other. You feel a slight migraine coming on. <laughs> okay then, the strike went through. My axe was two, six, and a four. The sneak attack adds six more. He rolls the dice. You gaze out the window for a moment and back. They were counting points. So that makes four and two and four plus six for the sneak attack, 16 total. Zine effect recoils under the blow of the axe and insults you. Do we know how much life he has? No, you have no way of knowing. But we can guess, he had close to 900 points at the beginning of the final battle. He must have taken about 700 away, maybe more. Uh, so he's not doing too well? Your passengers grin. In just a few seconds, Xenofax back is to the wall. His shape becomes clearer. Behind the odd, opaque black smoke, you make out the tired and worn body of an old man. Xenofax is old? Xenofax was an all-powerful wizard. He takes on his barbaric warrior voice again. And he won't live a day longer. He raises a wrinkled hand. Her voice changes. She's imitating the old man. Wait, wait, I surrender. The boy gets angry in an overly dramatic way. He acts out his anger with an open, frothing mouth. Nonsense. It sounds like a foreign word in the boy's mouth. The game master begins to moan. I swear to you, I submit to your power, your axe and your dagger have sufficiently slashed my flesh and my mana. In a soft voice, the boy whispers. That means magic. And I have no strength left. You hunted me down in the only palace. I was finally at peace. Two against one, I know when to admit defeat. Help me up and I promise I'll go away. She goes back to her game master voice again. He reaches towards you, his nails dirty, his hands creased with age, his palms streaked with scars. Magic does that, it wears on people. But don't lose your bearings, Chubak, my friend. This man is a murderer, a tyrant, a demon. I'll leave it up to you, Sangrana. I choose? Fine, then. He closes his eyes and looks terribly serious. I'd kill him with my bare hands if they were all I had left. He breaks out in a dramatic laughter. I raise my axe. And I, I pull out my dagger. At your feet, all shriveled up, Xenofax is shaking. He screams. No! Please don't! It comes out in a croak. The game master rolls several dice, one after the other, without a word. Uh, what are you doing there? Nothing, nothing. She slowly raises her head to look at you and her friend. At this very moment, time seems to come to a halt. Everything in the room flutters and stops. Everything but Xenofax's shadow. It jumps at Chewbacca's throat. What? His grasp constricts around your neck like the all-powerful grasp of a dreadful bronze python. Uh-huh. You can't breathe. You're becoming more damaged by the second. The boy jumps with joy. A countdown to death. Uh, am I going to die? Wait for them to continue. The boy turns to you, obviously very excited. It's a new rule in this edition of the game. I've been dying to try it for months. He turns to his friend. You're the best game master ever. The girl blushes a little. Ah. Why don't I explain it to our newcomer? In a countdown to death, we each get a turn and you can only choose one action. Each time you play, you get damage, which means your time before death is limited. Speaking of which... She goes back to her game master voice. His incisors are sinking into your neck. You feel your soul being sucked out of you. How many life points do I have left? The game master leans over to her friend. Where are we on life points? I, uh... He quickly browses the character profile. He's still at maximum 29. Good. 
She claps her hands together. Let's start with Sangrena. I see my friend Chubak suffocating and I strike. Close combat situation. So if you roll a 1 or a 2, you hit Chubak. A 3 or 4 and you miss. A 5 or 6, you reach your target. Uh. Don't worry, I have my dexterity bonus. So plus 1 on each roll. The die rolls across the board. Phew, 2 plus 1 makes 3. I miss. The game master also looks relieved. You miss Xenofax, but also Chupak. I thought it was over. We were lucky. Your turn, Chupak. May I remind you that Xenofax is strangling you and has your arm in a hold. Pretty hard to move in those circumstances, but not impossible. You clear your throat. Can I do some pickpocketing, maybe? If you move, he'll probably tighten his grip on your throat. If you stay still, it might make it easier for your partner to aim. What to do? The game master looks impatient. I throw myself against the wall? Maybe. Good idea. You throw yourself back and Xenofax lets go in surprise. For just a second, you feel free. The wound around your neck is painful, but you have a fleeting sensation. You're regaining strength. Fleeting? Yes, fleeting, because Xenofax strikes back in turn and pins you down again. This time, his tail wraps around to ensure your legs can't move anymore. He whispers. She starts talking with Xenofax's voice again. You won't escape so easily, Chubak. His voice, so close to your ear, paralyzes you. It sounds almost familiar. The boy turns to her. Oh, no, you can't be serious. The girl waves her hand to silence him. Okay, second round of the countdown of death. Pierre, try not to kill our driver, please. He flashes you an embarrassed grin. I'm a warrior, so I strike. Pierre, it would be a shame for your ex to end up decapitating our poor friend here. I'm role-playing, Shine. Sorry, that's just how it is. Their voices become more distant the longer their argument draws on. Apparently, Pierre's the type that always likes to play the rough guy, and Shaheen wants her players to have some finesse. Your mind wanders for a while. Pierre and Shaheen, odd pair. Where exactly are they from? Hey, can you hear me? You snapped out of your thoughts. Sorry. I said that Pierre missed Xenofax again. Uh oh. Exactly, but we might still have one chance. The Dem Ring. Dem? Yes, it means... She looks embarrassed for a minute and spits out. It means Dies Ex Machina. Most importantly, it's a treasure. An all-powerful ring you found in your father's body. It can spark an explosion of fire. But if you use it, well, you die. But Xenofax would die too. You don't quite get what the problem is. After all, it's just an imaginary character. So what do you do? I don't know. I don't know. We should keep fighting. Both passengers pout. <laughs> really? I mean, the pal is not looking very good. I'm sure. Chubak, you choose not to use the ring. As your turn starts, Xenofax's voice resonates in your head. Oh, come on, spit it out. Pierre. Sorry. She speaks in her Xenofax voice. Chubak, why are you doing this? Wasn't killing our father enough? Oh no, it's a brother scenario again. The boy gives a high-pitched yelp. I knew it, it's his brother. No. Why is this scenario following me around everywhere? The scene begins to feel far away, blurry. The game master goes back to her normal voice. Xenofax strikes, but using his very last bit of strength. Dice roll, screams abound, your mind is far far from your taxi. What are the fucking chances? Your brother? Oh no, I do have a brother, please. Don't let him be a not case someone taps you on the shoulder calls to you 
You collect yourself and break. Uh, shit, 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 I'm sorry. Mm, and back, the kid, seem, the kid seemed surprised. You wouldn't answer. We were getting worried. I don't know what came over me, I'm really sorry. In any case, we lost. Xenofax killed you. So it's over? There wasn't a way I could win without you, so we ended it. Xenofax won. You start driving again and attempt to gather your thoughts. Ah, uh, sorry. The boy has a strange expression, but his friend looks rather relieved. No, really. We needed to end this game. Pierre? Pierre is disappointed, but Pierre will move on, won't he? He shrugs. What choice do I have? Exactly. We have finals coming up, college applications to fill out. We won't have time for this kind of thing anymore. It was great while it lasted, but now it's time to... Don't say it. To grow up. She turns to her friend and smiles. I'm messing with you, Pierre. Don't worry, we'll keep playing. It's just not the same without Rodolf. A few minutes later, you arrive at Plus de Etoile. It's right here. He points to one of the fanciest buildings in the neighborhood. You pull over as soon as you see a free spot. The girl pays the fare as her friend puts the game pieces on board away. Thank you for tonight. It was... It was really very kind of you. Even if we didn't manage to kill Xenofax. For what it's worth, if you enjoyed it, there are places in Paris where you can play, you know? His friend looks at him with amusement. Come on, Pierre. I... I wanted to thank you. It was really nice of you to do this. Thanks for the game. The girl waves to you. With utmost delicacy, they exit the taxi, taking the game board with them. You watch them as they enter the building. You immediately notice the security cameras just above the door in the lobby, which is so well lit it can't be good for the environment. You turn the key in the ignition. Xenofax was... You shake your head, push the dark thoughts back, back into the deepest part of your mind. Strangle it. You close your eyes, clench your eyelids shut. You sit like this for a moment before taking a deep breath. Okay, well, you're teenagers, you might not have that much money. Oh well. That was a really long taxi drive. So... We are going to continue our night shift in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.